Okay. Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to chair this important session. Um, it's a very exciting time, I think, having just seen the results of uh, various late-breaking trials. We will focus today's session on the Radiance HTN Solo primary outcomes. Um, and this will be an opportunity for us to do a deeper dive, uh, both on the results as well as on the implications of this technology going forward. Um, I think we've really, I'm going to make a few remarks and then uh, hand off to uh, Michelle Azizi, my co-PI in the study, to present the study results. Um, I think we've really come full circle in our understanding of renal denervation, and now for certain we can say that it is effective at lowering blood pressure. Uh, this was very important that we do a rigorous, uh, well-controlled trial. Um, in a very clear setting to have this kind of certainty, uh, which I think we didn't have just a year ago. It's definitely true that having a sham control, uh, we understand is more and more important, particularly in a setting like this, um, where we know that there may be a placebo effect. But it wasn't the only factor contributing to the success of this and other trials. The other factors are really having very consistent conduct and rigorous uh, design. Um, a very clear protocol, which I, I want to thank uh, both Recor and uh, Michelle and the steering committee for contributing to, um, and um, effective technology to be able to demonstrate that the denervation procedure um, could work and, and show biological proof of principle. So to be honest, more than coming full circle, I think we now have a better understanding of renal denervation that there truly is an effect and that this is present in, in patients with mild to moderate hypertension. And combined with the efficacy, uh, we've shown the proof of principle, but also uh, the ability to really seriously consider device-based therapy for hypertension in the future. Um, and I think this is important for our patients because it's an alternative that doesn't require the daily compliance that we have with medications. Now, uh, none of the studies so far are head-to-head -head comparison, but I think um, it's something to think about for the future, how, how we can demonstrate the role in clinical practice. So this is very exciting for us and for our patients who uh, we saw in the enrollment of this trial really um, came to the study sites with a great enthusiasm for participating in the trial. This was a unique study. Um, even in the recruitment of patients, where we um, had not just the traditional direct-to-patient communication, but in this case, we actually used a Facebook campaign that really allowed patients to come directly uh, to the study centers and express their interest um, in, in coming off of medications for the study. So I'm not going to spend too much more time. I want to leave time to do a deep dive. So in this session, we will uh, have Michelle Azizi present the results of the study um, with a little bit more granularity um, uh, that reflects what's published in the Lancet publication today. Uh, Felix will talk about uh, the uh, procedural technique. Uh, Roland will, will um, walk us through some of the implications for a future treatment of patients in clinical practice. And Ajay Kirtane, important uh, new member of the principal investigator team. He's going to be joining as co-principal investigator uh, with Michelle Azizi. So I think it's a great team, and I'm looking forward to this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, and uh, thank you to all to be here to, and to share with us these uh, results, which have been already presented by Laura, and we will have a little bit more time to discuss about these results. Uh, I have just one announcement to make. If you have questions, use the microphone, because there, uh, there is a, a session which is filmed, so they need that you use microphone. So I will give this talk on behalf of Laura, Mori, and I. And uh, I'm for those who are not uh, don't, do not know me. I'm coming from Paris. I'm uh, working at the Paris uh, University and uh, Georges Pompidou Hospital in Paris. And Laura is from Harvard uh, University and working in the Brigham Women's Hospital. And we have been very pleased to work together and, and with all the investigators to achieve this uh, clinical trial. So these are my conflict of interest. 
I want you to remember what was the objective of the study. It was to investigate whether endovascular ultrasound renal denervation reduces ambulatory blood pressure in patients with hypertension in the absence of antihypertensive medications. All the words here are very important. Endovascular ultrasound, never used before. Ambulatory blood pressure as a and primary endpoint, which was not done, and also patients without any antihypertensive medication, so to get rid of the problem, confounding problem of antihypertensive medications and viable adherence to treatment. So all these points are very important, and we will see whether this treating patient like this will have or will not have an antihypertensive effect. So I will go very quickly on the device because Felix uh, will deeply uh, also speak about this. This is the Paradise uh, catheter here shown. You see there's a balloon catheter and you have water, <laughs> cooling water, and you have here this uh, ultrasound probe, probe which will, have, will make a renal ablation, this abl renal nerve ablation by heating. So, and, but you will have really details about this by, uh, by uh, uh, Felix. So this is the study design, and we also, it was something, I think it was a complicated design because we had to speak the same language across the Atlantic. We, you, will see, <laughs> you will see that uh, we have half of the centers in Europe and half of the center in the, in the US. So we had to speak same languages and also to use same type of medication and approaches. But however, we manage because we are reasonable people and, friend, <laughs> and really friendly people together and to build up this, this trial. So this was a, a blinded, sham control, randomized one-to-one -one trial, uh, including 146 patients in the trial. So this trial was also powered to detect a six millimeter mercury difference in ABPM systolic blood pressure between the treatment with an alpha risk of 5%, 80% of uh, uh, beta risk. So this is also a difference from other trials, and specifically, and I think we should also be very happy that the spiral of medication uh, in terms of proof of this uh, concept showed that there was a lowering blood pressure effect, but as what said, was said by the investigators, the study was not powered to detect truly this difference. So this is a very important thing. And why six millimeter of mercury? This number is not coming from, you know, just looking the stars and things like this. It was based upon something reasonable and what we observed also in the French Denerachten study, which showed that there was six millimeter mercury difference in patients treated only by medications and those treated by renal innovation and medication. So, and it's a reasonable and plausible difference between two groups which, uh, which could be demonstrated. So the key entry to the criteria are shown here. You see have patients with hypertension, either control on one or two medication or uncontrolled with zero to two medications. So mild to moderate hypertension. And we, we stopped all medication during four weeks and they had, should have a daytime ABPM above 135 over 85 millimeters of mercury, but less than 170 over 105 millimeters of mercury. You see the, uh, the age range, 18 to 75, we exclude the two old patients because data from Felix in his work, but also in our works in the Global Simplicity Registry have shown that patients with isolated systolic hypertension, specifically if they are old enough, they have uh, abnormality in the compliance of grid vessels, and they have also an increased vascular stiffness and respond less to any strategy, not only denervation, but also pill strategy. They are very difficult to treat. These patients should have had a low uh, pro risk profile, no prior cardiovascular events, no cerebral vascular event, no uncontrolled type 2 diabetes. A G EGFR above 40 mils per minute and eligible renal artery anatomy detected before renal angiography with CT or uh, MR and uh, <laughs> magnetic resonance angiography. So they should not have renal stenosis. Uh, they should have a bilateral diameter between 4 and 8 millimeter and length of renal artery greater than uh, 25 millimeter. 
So this is the flow chart of the study. So you have seen here office blood pressure, medication washout. They should comply, we should ob obtain and confirm that these patients were hypertensive after stopping their antihypertensive drug, but not too much. Then they should have uh, imaging, first non-invasive imaging. And I think also it's one of the point of this trial is that all these imaging were sent to a core lab, which analyze the, the imaging and also make the strategical plans to treat the renal arteries. So, and to reduce, again, the variability in the way of treating the renal arteries with the catheter, renal catheter denervation. Then, once the patient had all this, they were uh, if randomized into, in the cat lab, into renal denervation or sham procedure. So the sham procedure was restricted to the renal angiography. So they had bilateral renal denervation according to the, the, uh, the plans which were uh, observed uh, during the CTA or MRI, and then followed uh, during the two months, at one month and two months, and the primary efficacy endpoints was the blood pressure and the ambulatory blood pressure at two months. What is very important that it was that no antihypertensive medication was allowed, escape, uh, uh, unless there was an escape blood pressure criteria which was exceeded. You have also to know that the outcome assessors, those, those who have measured blood pressure and have seen the patient outside the cat lab, were completely blinded to the randomization. Follow-up is continuing at six months, 12, and three years. These are the study centers, you see, balance between Europe and US and all our good friends and that we, we could achieve to include all the patients in trial because of their work. So I think they should be, uh, at the end of the talk, applause because without them and without the patient, without all this team, we could not achieve this work. And you see, it's a tremendous work to randomize 146 patients. We, have, we had to, um, to see, to enroll 800, more than 800 patients and only 170 of them underwent renal angiography. 24 were still excluded at the time of angiography, and only 146, which was the number planned, were randomized. But what a job before arriving here. And the majority of the patients were excluded because of blood pressure criteria, sometimes because of renal arterial anatomy. This was a nightmare because when you had all the other criteria to find that, ah, finally it's not, it's not feasible, it was a terrible thing. Then we randomized perfectly the patient, so we had the perfect randomization, which was balance between centers, etc. And 74 were randomized to the renal innovation group and 72 in the, to the sham procedure in the intention to treat the uh, uh, population. You see that uh, uh, we have only one missing ABPM and, uh, uh, in the two groups, so uh, the, 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 the follow-up was very good. We have also analyzed the pair protocol population. You see one, uh, 64 in the renal innovation group and 58 in the pair protocol population. 14 patients were excluded here, 10 patients were excluded here. The main reason was restart of antihypertensive treatment. Even when the blood pressure threshold was not exceeded because patients or physicians wanted to restart the antihypertensive treatment. And this occurred more frequently in the sham group than in the renal innovation group. We had also two patients who did not have the renal procedure. So these are the clinical characteristics here. So because the randomization was well done, so we have a balanced population between the two groups. The mean age is over 54. You see we have a majority of men. Uh, the white race is majority, around 70 to 80 percent. We have 17 uh, percent of black people. There are overweight people with a BMI of to around 30. We have a low prevalence of obstructive sleep apnea, and EGFR by definition was normal. We have less, I think, one patient only who had a G EGFR below 60 minutes per minute. So they do not have any prior cardiovascular complication, so very low risk patients. So these are the baseline blood pressure, still also well balanced between the two groups, and these are the blood pressure achieved after four weeks of uh, drug, antihypertensive drug washout. 
you see that uh, uh, the office blood pressure was 155 over 100 millimeters of mercury, confirmed by daytime ambulatory blood pressure monitoring and 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. We focused on daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure because this is the blood pressure is higher with, during the daytime. So if we want to look to variation, the higher the blood pressure you will have, it will be more easy to find. It is less variable and patients adhere more to the daytime blood pressure measurement than to the nighttime blood pressure measurements. So these are the, I will skip this procedural details because also uh, Felix will could talk about this to go to the results. This is the primary efficacy endpoint. The primary efficacy endpoint is a change in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure at two months. And you see in the renal innovation group, we had the 8.5 millimeters of mercury decrease in a, uh, ambulatory daytime systolic blood pressure. And in a CHAM group, 2.2 millimeters of mercury, which gives a baseline adjusted difference of 6.3 millimeters of mercury between the two groups in favor of renal denivation. So highly statistically significant and look to the confidence interval, the lowest boundary is three millimeters of mercury, which is also a very good thing. Now, if we look specifically also to the per protocol analysis, we see here, and I will un explain you why we also focus on the per protocol analysis, is that remember that uh, we had some patients who were taking pills before the two months evaluation. So uh, specifically those in the sham control group. So if we want to see a pure effect of renal innovation, we should get rid of this patient who have taken antihypertensive pills outside the requirement of the protocol. So when would you do this? You see here in the renal innovation group, the blood pressure is lowering a similar, minus 8.5 minutes of mercury. But here in the sham group, well, it's much lower, going from 2.2 to zero millimeters of mercury. So this enlarged the between group difference and once again looked at the boundaries of the confidence interval going to from five to 11 millimeters of mercury in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure. These are also very important results. These are secondary results, but we have at hypertension specialists to, lead, to look whether you have consistency in blood pressure lowering using different means of measuring blood pressure. And this, is, this was the case. You have here the intention to trick and the per protocol analysis, and you see that these are the difference between the two groups, huh, between the renal denivated group and the sham group. And you see this are consistently de uh, a decrease in blood pressure, which is larger with renal innovation, and the phenomenon is amplified in the per protocol analysis. So in terms of safety, you have heard about this. We have absolutely no uh, events during the two months of evaluation of, of the study, at uh, 30 days, but also at, at two months. Some patients have been followed up until uh, uh, six months, and we have one event of new renal artery stenosis as within six months, but probably it was a pre-existing stenosis which progressed. So these are also important data, the individual, individual patient response at two months. This is a waterfall plot here, and you see that patients randomized to renal innovation uh, in 60% of the cases have a greater than five millimeter of mercury drop in ambulatory daytime systolic blood pressure, whereas in the sham procedure is 33%. So the difference is highly significant, and in other terms, in terms of absolute uh, numbers, you need to treat three patients to uh, that one patient had uh, at least five millimeter mercury drop in blood pressure. This is also the number of patients or the percentage of patients who achieved controlled blood pressure without adding antihypertensive medication. So we can focus on the left side of the slide here, uh, those with a daytime blood pressure below 135 over 80 millimeters of mercury, and you see that there's a more fourfold increase in the percentage of patients with controlled blood pressure. So in terms of absolute number, you need to treat four to five patients to have patient at two months, short term, patients with controlled blood pressure without taking any antihypertensive medication. Then we have to, we looked at those who needed 
so restarting antihypertensive medication, specifically after the two months visit, and you see still that we have a major difference between the two groups. 55% of the patients, according to the protocol, were added an antihypertensive drug in the denovation group, compared to around 80% of the patient in the renal denovation, uh, in the sham procedure group. These are data which have not yet been shown. It's the pre-specified subgroup analysis, and you see that there are, it's very consistent efficacy of renal denovation uh, across different subgroups, uh, uh, taking into account ethnicity, age, so those less than 55, those have, having more than 55, males and females, US, Europe, baseline ABPM, office systolic blood pressure, with a something very special here in terms of abdominal, uh, abdominal obesity, but we are not sure that this has a true uh, significance indeed. The blood pressure lowering effect of renal denervation was observed in both lean and obese patients, and what we observe is that the sham group in pa lean patient had also a major decrease in blood pressure. So this is why in those without abdominal uh, obesity, there was no difference between the two groups due to a greater drop in blood pressure in the sham group that we cannot explain. So to conclude, endovascular ultrasound-based renal denervation effectively lowered blood pressure in patients with mild to moderate hypertension who were randomized and followed for two months off medication, demonstrating greater reduction in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure than a sham procedure, 6.3 millimeters greater in ITT analysis or 8.2 millimeters greater in per protocol analysis, a consistent blood pressure reduction in 24-hour AB uh, office and home blood pressure, a higher rate of control blood pressure in the absence of medication with an increase by fourfold of this control rate, no major events within 30 days of the procedures. The following up is going on through three years and uh, for longer term efficacy and, and also safety. And Enrollment is ongoing in a parallel blinded sham control trial of patients with resistant hypertension, and we count on you to send patients to be included in this trial. So I would thank you, all of you, and I'm happy here to show you the, the Lancet publication, which has been just released this, this morning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, great presentation of the primary results and also deeper dive. I think we just have time, maybe for, if there's any, maybe just take, take one question from the audience. Um, make sure you use the microphone. Or make, maybe make um, a panel, global panel discussion at the end. I think we're want. running a little bit over, okay. so we want to move on to the next talk. Um, okay. So I if there are no know. questions, we'll move on and we'll hold questions for when we have the whole panel ready. Felix. So uh, the next speaker will be Dr. Felix Mafood, who will speak to the renal denervation procedure um, specific to the ReCore Paradise technology. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, colleagues and friends, it's my pleasure to talk about the renal denervation, uh, ultrasound based renal denervation system, indeed, the uh, Paradise, ReCore Paradise technology that has been utilized in the study which Michelle uh, presented uh, momentarily to you. I promise to be brief so that we have some uh, time for discussion about the procedure also. I'll, I'll skip that slide, it's more about the background, why it is important to target renal sympathetic nerves and that we're not only focusing on the afferent but also the efferent sympathetic nervous system. And um, that probably, and this is an outlook into the future, whenever you affect the afferent sympathetic nerves, you're capable of reducing central sympathetic nervous outflow and thereby central sympathetic nervous system activity. And this is of course a nice treatment option and opportunity for other disease states that are characterized by an increased sympathetic nervous system activity such as heart failure, arrhythmias, or chronic kidney disease. We started by chance probably with hypertension. That is where we are. Um, this is the foundation actually. These uh, early surgical trials, um, and the largest was published in 1953 in JAMA actually where surgeons uh, performed a surgical sympathectomy where they cut all sympathetic nerves. And what they found actually was a profound reduction in blood pressure in uh, the vast majority of patients. But interestingly, there were some patients who did not respond to that uh, surgical approach, but they had an improvement in morbidity and mortality, although blood pressure was not reduced. So indeed indicating that there might be 
some other effects non-related to blood pressure lowering of um, modulating sympathetic nervous system activity. The challenge is, of course, to achieve a, an effective renal denervation um, by an endovascular approach. We have learned a lot from the early days where we started with the monopolar RF technology, getting now into ultrasound in the space of ultrasound that is uh, the technology we're discussing now. But we've learned about the anatomy, the distribution, the density of the nerves, and you can nicely see that indeed from proximate to distance, not only the density and location changes, but also the distribution pattern changes. In more distal segments of the renal arteries, the nerves are getting closer to the parenchyma. Or in other words, if you start treating the proximal main renal artery, you have to get deeper into the tissue to affect a significant amount of renal sympathetic nerves. What we also learned from preclinical work is that a circumferential approach is very important to affect a significant amount of nerves that is in part related to the microanatomy, to so-called heat sinks and heat tanks that are located in the adventitia, that are mainly lymph nodes and other smaller arteries and veins located in uh, the perivascular space. So in circumferential approach is definitely something we're shooting for. And this is the system that is accompanying this. It's an ultrasound-based technology. You have seen it before. It's ultrasound heating, so circumferential ablation. In the main renal artery, we have a, a cool blood flow that is circulating through the balloon, actually cooling the endothelium, protecting the endothelium while the energy is emitted to the adventitia. We have an ablation depth of one to six millimeters, a length of five millimeters, and we emit normally two to three ablations, uh, seven seconds each. That is the system. It's a six French uh, compatible over the wire balloon catheter with an automatic control of ablation energy and cooling. It is in principle modifiable, so it could be that one of the future systems allows to modify energy output according to vessel diameter. That's definitely something of interest, I think, and that is capable of treating renal arteries that ranges from 3.5 to 8 millimeters in diameter. I mentioned that, that before we have a circumferential ablation that is created indeed with less procedural variability. It is probably the system or one of the systems that is least operator dependent. Um, you can achieve a great nerve coverage and um, again, the overall emission time is pretty short. You will see that in a second when I show you the procedure characteristics of the radiance a trial. This is a nice video I'm always showing when I'm talking about ultrasound because it nicely shows the circumferentiality of the technology. This donut here on the left-hand side is the first ultrasound sonication which has been completed. You can see here in the thermal gel actually, which uh, turns opaque when um, it's heated up. Uh, you can nicely see that the donut is indeed created circumferentially, but what is probably more important, and you'll see that in a second, is that you can really uh, spare the um, endothelium. <clears throat> so you can nicely see that we're indeed not heating the endothelium, but we're heating the adventitia, and that is where the nerves are located. This is an angiogram. Um, one of the patients treated, you can see the overwire approach. You can also see the balloon. Um, that's a low-pressure balloon, of course, inflated. You check that you have uh, complete balloon coverage of the renal artery. You emit seven seconds of energy. You do that twice along the renal artery, and then you are finished a pretty straightforward procedure. These are examples of preclinical histology images, uh, in a porcelain model seven days post-treatment. You can nicely see the circumferential coverage of the ablation. You can also see here uh, some ablated nerves, and again, the target ablation region of one to six millimeters is hit by this technology. We've completed preclinical work. Uh, that is a paper published in Euro Intervention a couple of years ago, the foundation actually of the technology. Some interesting features here. So the control here on the left-hand side, you can see um, a profound reduction in NAPI concentration following two and three emissions. That's definitely what we're following clinically. There's no significant addition if you add three or four emissions, at least in that porcine model, um, related to NAPI reductions at seven days post-treatment. What are we getting? That is probably one of the most important questions with ultrasound um, emitted into the renal artery uh, space. What you can see here is that we're getting with a penetration depth of six millimeters 
in the main renal artery almost 90% of all nerves that are located in the adventitia. I promised to talk also briefly about the procedural aspects of the radiant solo trial. Treatment successfully delivered in almost all patients, 96%. Total a number of emissions, 5.4. Total emission time, 38 seconds. Procedural time was doubled in those patients who received the renal denervation. So indeed, the denervation itself took around about 30 minutes. Contrast vo volume used, um, 141. It's important to note that we started with an angiogram, an autogram actually, and almost 30 to 40 cc of this uh, procedural contrast volume that was used is accounted for the um, autogram. And fluoroscopy exposure was 14 minutes in the renal denervation group and five minutes in the sham group. No uh, safety events, you have seen that slide before, presented by Michelle, and you have also seen that there is indeed a very consistent response in terms of uh, blood pressure lowering. This is the waterfall plot Michelle presented earlier today. An interesting finding, though, is, um, of course, the numbers are getting small. This is um, a uh, subgroup analysis of those patients with different number of emissions. It's always a play of chances, right, to achieve uh, a significant nerve damage. Um, it might well be that you by chance hit with one emission less nerves than you expect to damage. So what you, we see here is a numerically higher response in those patients who received more emissions. Seven was indeed here the number where we have a slightly larger drop in blood pressure compared to the others. Definitely something we have to follow in future studies and of interest to understand the technology. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, um, the renal nerves are an attractive therapeutic agent. I hope that is clear. We have seen the trials now being presented and providing the proof of principle that indeed by doing so we lower a blood pressure. The Paradise system is designed for a consistent and circumferential ablation of uh, the perivascular space. It protects the renal artery and the non-target uh, tissue. We have short ablation times, again, seven seconds, um, which may increase patient comfort compared to other approaches. And um, we have seen that this technology used in patients with hypertension without medication is efficacious in lowering blood pressure. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Felix, that was a fantastic overview. Um, we have time for a couple questions, uh, either on Michelle's portion or F uh, Felix's portion. We'll also have a panel discussion um, to conclude. Any questions from the from the audience? So, uh, Felix, you've you've seen these systems, um, many of them, uh, over time. I mean, how do you feel in terms of the iterations? Uh, David Kanzari was asked this in the main session. Um, is this something at this point you feel is easily translatable to many interventionalists around the world? And this approach here is definitely, as I mentioned before, one that leads not that need not that needs not much of training. It's a pretty straightforward procedure. Of course, you need to be you know you need to be trained in real artery interventions. You need to be capable of especially taking care of uh, complications that might occur, such as dissections, which we have not seen, or stenosis over time, definitely. But it's running over the wire. And um, you do not need to ensure that you have enough vessel wall contact as needed with any RF technology. So I think this, from a, from a training perspective, is the device where, where least training is needed compared to other systems. One comment that I, I would make, um, when we look at the number of admissions, that was based on the length of the renal arteries, exactly. how the admissions were yeah. delivered. Um, and I actually would look at that and say, no matter the number of emissions or the length of the renal artery, all of those treatment groups had a, had a positive response or reduction in blood pressure. So um, in some ways, um, it's really a consistent finding across a number of different admissions, uh, which just goes to the point that it was a straightforward um, procedure for, for all the patients who were treated. Another interpretation maybe that in those where we performed more ablations, the longer arteries we treated more distally compared to those with two emissions per artery, right? And that might also be an interesting observation. So we started more distally in those with more emissions and had more ablation, more, you know, more successful um, nerve damage achieved with these emissions. Maybe, Michelle, um, some thoughts. You've studied patients now off meds, on meds. Obviously, the on med trial is still ongoing. Um, what are your expectations for the populations? Are there going to be differences, do you think, or is this well, now consistent? 
the population will be by definition different. You have a resistant hypertensive population of patients included uh, which are who are resistant to a triple therapy in a single pill, so this is uh, very different, in whom secondary hypertension have been excluded, and in the other part, patients who are off medication. But blood pressure lowering effect, the continuous effect, so I expect from six to 10 millimeters of mercury drop in daytime ambulatory systolic blood pressure. There's no reason that it may be different. I think we can be also reassured by the data coming from Spiral On presented this morning. The drop in, in ambulatory blood pressure was around, if I remember correctly, seven minutes of mercury, something like this. So we are in the same range. When you give, it's, it's a continuous phenomenon. Even in normotensive subjects, when you give an antihypertensive drug, you will have a tiny drop in blood pressure but when you give it to other patients, you will have larger and larger blood, but it's a continuous phenomenon. There is no reason that you have on and off differences in terms of blood pressure lowering. The complexity there will be the confounding effect that we try to avoid with the treatment, antihypertensive treatment. We know that it's some added complexity because patients will follow or not follow strictly the antihypertensive drug they are, we are giving them during the trial because these are much more severe patients. Felix, why don't we have you come to the um, panel up here and we'll introduce the next speaker. Um, do you want yeah, to go ahead? So uh, I'm pleased to, to announce that so, uh, Professor Roland Schmider will give the next talk about the Radiance Asian Global Clinical Trial Program, current and uh, upcoming clinical studies of the paradise system and clinical implication. Roland, thank you very much. Dear chairpersons, dear colleagues, it's now my pleasure to bring up some issues of the clinical implications of the results of the Radiance HDN Solo, we just heard about that. And these are my conflict of interests, and I have focused on three aspects. First of all, we hear always about changes in office blood pressure, changes in ambulatory blood pressure, and without any doubt, 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure should be the choice if we do and if we run scientific trials. However, the numbers are different. And looking at this uh, study I've done in the past, it came up two lessons. First of all, the higher you start in the beginning, in other words, the pretreatment blood pressure, the greater is the response. So now we're having patients with mild to moderate hypertensive, so we can expect lower numbers than we are used from the numbers we heard of treatment resistant hypertension. That's called law of initial value. Nothing sensational. Second point here, you see the dark columns. These are changes in 24 ambulatory blood pressure, and they are quite different from the one of office blood pressure. This has been long observed. I want to show you from another study where it comes up with the same, the Dublin outcome study. What you can see here is, let me go, go through the arrows. If you start with a pre blood pressure of 180, and you look at the corresponding five years risk of cardiovascular death, it comes up 1.2. Now let's assume you reduce that risk to 1.0, and then you look at the same time what is the clinical ambulatory blood, the clinical office blood pressure, it's 150. So 30 milliliter mercury decrease in office blood pressure leads to a decrease of 20% five years risk. Looking at the same numbers from an ambulatory blood pressure perspective, if you decrease it from 1.2 to 1.0 again, well, the fall in 24 hour ambulatory blood pressure is just 10 milliliter mercury not 30. So it is within the subject that we have different numbers depending what kind of measure we are using. And what you can see here also, they have nighttime, 24 hour daytime. Some people say the curve, how far or how steep it is, has something to do with relation to the outcome. Well, I'm not quite sure about that. I'm not a statistician. I found it quite intriguing to, lead, to read just a couple of weeks ago this analysis of the Spanish multicenter national cohort, including 63,000 adults. It's a huge number. And they did a surf analysis about the value of the clinical ambulatory blood pressure as opposed to the 24-hour ambulatory and also to the daytime, nighttime, and so on. 
what you can see here at the first model, let's go for 24 hour systolic blood pressure. We have a hazard ratio of 1.58. Daytime, it's the same. Nighttime, it's the same. And if it's adjusted also for the clinical office blood pressure, we still have the same hazard ratio. Clearly indicating, and that's the conclusion of the others, the association of 24-hour systolic blood pressure with all cause and cardiovascular mortality was similar to set seen for daytime systolic pressure and nighttime systolic pressure, and remained significant in multivariate adjustments that included clinical office blood pressure. And then uh, these findings were consisting across all subgroups. So to make it very clear, I think if you look at daytime, nighttime or 24 hour, all three are valid points for analyzing changes in blood pressure with respect to cardiovascular and total mortality. Now let's come to the results. We have seen a certain decrease of blood pressure and the question of course is how can we translate that into cardiovascular outcome? Well, at the moment we have no randomized double blind or not double blind multicenter prospective trial with the heart endpoint, maze, or cardiovascular death, or total death. So we have to rely on other ways of, analyze, of analyzing this question. First of all, let me remind you, in the group of the Radiance Solo trial, we had here a group of mild to moderate patients mild, with mild to moderate essential hypertension or primary hypertension, and some of them may have an increased risk but I think we have seen that only a very few portion, actually a tiny portion, had already an evident cardiovascular <coughs> disease. So we are talking about an uncomplicated population, uncontrolled, <coughs> and in the range of stage one and two hypertension. So we are dealing with a po study population, hypertensive study population with other risk factors, and maybe some may have subclinical organ damage, but by and large, we are at the very first stage of the cardiovascular and renal continuum. Other studies so far focus at a, by a far later stages and thereby have a different prognosis. Now, that's the result on the right side, we just have seen several times, a little bit different. Office blood pressure fall by nearly 11 millimeter mercury, systolic, 24 ml blood pressure, only seven. Well, not disturbing, I showed you. The numbers are different, but the message is the same. Significantly different, not depicted here, to the shame control group. On the left side, you see a meta-analysis of the British epidemiologist Law, who analyzed monotherapies. A large group, 354 placebo-controlled monotherapies, all put together, and he found overall decrease with mon monotherapy 9.1, and 7.23 with in terms of ambulatory blood pressure calculated from the correlations I have shown you. So I think overall, more or less, the results we have seen with the Paradise Solo trial is equivalent to one plus or minus maybe one and a half drug equivalent we have been noticed from several pharmacological trials. Now there's just one way to look at it. Let's go the other way around. I've shown you a decrease in office blood pressure of 11. Now this consists of maybe several effects. Of course, a true effect by disrupting the real nerve traffic, but it's also the 11 millimeter mercury consistent. With, we have maybe some shame effect. There was a small shame effect always in the office blood pressure readings. But for the patient, that doesn't matter. He noticing my blood pressure on average would go down approximately 11 millimeter mercury. And when we go to the largest meta-analysis and meta-regression analysis I know so far, covering more than a half a million people, more than a hundred studies, we see here the numbers, this has been published uh, two years ago in the Lancet. And if you look at the reduction in systolic blood pressure, this regression, regression line trends in particular to a decrease of strokes, typical hypertension complication by 27%, a decrease of heart failure in these, in these days, also a typical hypertension-associated complication by 28%. So that we can expect, a decrease between 25 and 30% of typical hypertension-related complications. <coughs> Finally, I think real innovation is one specific we have to address in our thoughts when we talk to our patients about the various options he has to treat his, his blood pressure. First of well, um, it doesn't go forward. What I want to show you with the next slide, once 
maybe I succeed to go further. No? Yeah. One thing is very clear. Once the procedure is done, it's done. So simple is it. It's not at all dependent on any kind of adherence, whether the patient is taking every day, lifelong, his antihypertensive medication. And this is really a very crucial point. We just got aware, actually, about five, ten years ago, and with the help and assistance of the Real Innovation Study, that non-adherence is a major problem. It's a very complex problem. It's not that it's one course. It is the communication is very important. And socioeconomic background in various countries is different. Soci sociocultural background is also one thing I, we need to stress. And of course, the motivation of the patient and his interaction with his family members may also influence adherence. A very complex pattern. From a physician perspective, we know the more we describe, the worse is the adherence to the prescribed medication. But even if we just describe one, iron, one drug, monotherapy in a patient with mild hypertension, you can see, if you wait long enough, that this is related to hypertension-related events. This patient group here, in the long run, after eight, nine years, had also a worse prognosis in terms of outcome in comparison to those who had a high persistence of drug, and these are only patients with monotherapy. And, well, we have seen that also this morning. Adherence is a complex pattern. It's dynamic. You may be adherent at one time, and the next time you are no longer adherent. It is dynamic and therefore unpredictable. And with, think, I think with uh, renal innovation, we have uh, another option where adherence does not play a crucial role. And go further along, and that's my last slide, to the patient perspective. I was most astonished to read this, that as many as 30% of patients would prefer dying earlier to take more than to take more drugs. And actually, 8.2% would deal, if you want to say it in that simple terms, two years of their lives. I think this is astonishing. I think it's just a survey. Well, I think we have heard that from some of our patients that they would not like to have more drugs instead of just they would give maybe deal in some time of their life. I think this has, to, of course, to be repeated, but I think it's an important matter that the patients really think the patients are thinking different than we doctors usually assume. And finally, I think <laughs> with these studies, we will have starting a big debate. These were patients of therapy, uncontrolled. And I think we have noticed also in the radio and solar trial a big uh, interest in this uh, new technology, treating patients uh, and maybe offering them the chance to reduce the drug burden in a minority also to get rid of any drug. And when you look at the recruitment phase, there have been social media and 500,000 patients targeted within a, 50, within a range of 50 kilometers of the clinical experience centers and if, you calcul and if you make an extrapolation of that, this will come up to millions of patients who are interested in that field, and in particular in patients with mild to moderate hypertension. So that's a new, really, challenge for us as physicians to make then the right choice, to make the right choice for the patient. And I think this requires a shared decision-making processes, and I think we are just the beginning of that. So, dear colleagues, let me conclude. Daytime and 24-hour ambulant blood pressure are, pre are predictive of outcomes, and I think they are similarly predictive. If maintained for the long term, the drops in blood pressure demonstrated in the SOLO trial would be expected to lead to a meaningful reduction in cardiovascular risk between 25 and 30 percent risk reduction of the typically hypertension-related complications, stroke, and heart failure. And endovascular ultrasound renal innovation is unique among hypertensive therapies because daily patient adherence is simply not required. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roland. And uh, your presentation is open for discussion. One or two questions from the audience, please. So one, uh, yes, please. Um, Attila, you has uh, United Kingdom. Um, 
I was impressed uh, by the so-called waterfall uh, slides and wanted to challenge the uh, <coughs> uh, kind of approach that uh, renal denervation can actually uh, can result in a lifelong solution to hypertension and patients can get rid of uh, medications. So uh, probably the uh, synonymous I could use is the uh, treatment of VPV syndrome uh, through uh, ablation, uh, which can get rid of antiarrhythmic treatment. In the individual patients, both in the SHAM and the treated of, uh, groups, there were many who did respond, even in the SHAM group, with even 20 or more millimeter mercury reduction. And also in the treated group, there, there were patients who didn't uh, respond. So how do you explain it? Uh, well, I think this is a complexity uh, seen in all trials that to a certain intervention, some patients respond very well and some do not respond. And of course, it's always an intriguing question because the physician in front of me is a sitting a single patient and I want to give him the right advice. At the moment, I just can say to him, well, only I'm a, a minority. If you're in the very early stage of the disease, you have a chance that you don't need a drug for a certain time period. Because in the Western Hemisphere, we know over decades, we have always an increase of blood pressure. So we're making just one step lower about a certain age we will have again the question of how to treat him then. So the, what we really the message is, the drug burden can be decreased. This is very clear. And we do not know at the moment, at least I do not know, and maybe other things are still struggling with the question, which are predictors to identify the patients who respond most. It's still an unsolved issue. And I think also we, with all fairness, even if we have, let's say here, 100, 150 patients included, and if we combine with all, its numbers is too small to make a real good predictive model. Yeah. So probably you would need a better biomarker for identifying well, the patients, every like, like the delta wave. Yeah, every delta suggestion wave. is more than welcome, <laughs> actually, really. Like, like the delta wave on ECG for VPV patients. Mm -hmm. Just to add something in the sham group, you, you notice effectively that there's a drop in blood pressure also with the sham procedure. Remember that the uh, uh, greater number of patients in the sham group were prescribed with antihypertensive drug. Okay, if you look to the, uh, the, the Lancet paper, you will see also those in, uh, who were removed from this analysis. Still, there are, there are patients who have a drop in blood pressure when you do a sham procedure. Every procedure that you can make have a sham effect. Uh, very recently, just t 15 days ago, there was a, a, a paper published in the Lancet, um, I'm sorry, in British Medical Journal for pain injection of cement for uh, vertebra for patient with compression, a sham procedure um, uh, again uh, against a true procedure. The number of patients with drop of, of pain stopping opioids, everything was similar with the sham that was the, on the true procedure. We cannot really, I think it's, we, we have learned here, which is very important, is a major effect of the placebo. But placebo effect, or whatever, sham effect, is not nothing. Our work, when we see a patient, we have an action as a doctor, we prescribe a pill, and the, the effect we will observe, if some effect ap appears, is the addition of the placebo effect plus the intervention we have made, always, always and uh, always. We have this interaction, human interaction with the patient, and this human interaction, we cannot get rid of it, and this is our job, is to be in interaction with the patients. But you're true, this is right. We, this is an important matter. Okay, thank you very much, Roland. So we move to the, we move to the last presentation given by uh, Dr. A.J. A. Kerton, which is the future of the Radiance program, and it's a huge program. A.J., please. Well, thanks so much for having me at the meeting and also to Chair, Chair Pearson for allowing me to speak at this event. Um, 
I, I just wanted to take a step back and to show you some of the slides and the trials that have been done um, in the ReCorp program to date. Uh, we were talking to um, some of the team outside, and this has been a progress uh, thing going on for 10 plus, 12 plus years of design, iteration, first in human studies, titration of dose, and beyond. And to achieve the accomplishments today um, is really a testament to all the investigators as well as the ReCorp team for persevering through with this program. Um, <laughs> essentially, the program consists of uh, first in man and early stage studies, but has evolved beyond that point to include three sham controlled trials that are actively either enrolled, as you heard today, or ongoing, um, including the TRIO study as well as the REQUIRE trial, which is an approval study for Japan. Uh, in total, this uh, encompasses 350 plus patients who've been treated with this technology, um, allowing um, some uh, solid semblance of uh, assessment of safety as well as efficacy within the program as a whole. And this has been going on for quite some time. As far as where the program is going from here on out, because I know we're running short on time, um, what we've seen this morning are the results of SOLO, but TRIO and REQUIRE are still ongoing. And these ultimately set up for a pivotal trial for US FDA approval, uh, which is currently under review uh, at the FDA. The anticipated start time of this trial will be ambitiously later this year, uh, with the plan to enroll uh, hopefully rapidly over the ensuing uh, year or two. And essentially, that's the program for hypertension as a whole. But there are additionally other trials uh, that have been envisioned for other disease states that may be sympathetically mediated, be they uh, related to arrhythmias, heart failure, CKD, metabolic syndrome, and beyond. And some of this will obviously be explored um, with further investigators that have already looked at this area um, as the trials uh, proceed. There are additionally radi uh, uh, registries and uh, registries not just in uh, the e EU and the United States after approval, but potentially also in, in uh, China as well. So just to sort of summarize where we stand today with this therapy is I think the fair statement is fair, and Laura and Michelle both mentioned this and contributed to this, um, is that the SOLO study has gen generated definitive evidence, in fact, biologic proof that the Paradise Ultrasound Renal Denervation System reduces blood pressure through a straightforward procedure. Felix showed you at that, and I think that's a real positive attribute of this particular procedure, um, especially if one were to consider um, expanding it to other uh, investigators and patient populations. The magnitude of blood pressure response demonstrated in SOLO, if shown to be durable and safe, would be expected to correlate with meaningful reductions in cardiovascular events, even in non-adherent patients. And the talk that Roland gave is really apropos of this. I think until today, we've heard many talks about the potential for this technology, but buttressed by these sham controlled trials that we've seen today, I think this really starts to approach reality. And I think that's very exciting for patients and for physicians. And so with that in mind, we're not done. Additional work does need to be done to demonstrate durability, safety, efficacy in the presence of medications, and the health economics that would be required to support funding of this for our patients who might benefit. TRIO, REQUIRE, and the longer-term results of SOLO are going to help uh, identify these efficacy and safety issues and will hopefully capture data on durability because follow-up is ongoing in that regard. I do want to emphasize that we do anticipate on uh, launching a pivotal trial for U.S. FDA approval later this year. And pilot trials in other states um, are also being investigated and will be forthcoming as well. So with, I think, that, we have maybe a brief couple minutes for uh, time for discussion, um, and uh, we can then conclude the session. If there are any questions, please feel free to come up to the microphones on either side of the room. We'd love to have a, one or two questions for discussion before we close. Yeah, everybody's happy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that um, it's been an excellent session. Um, being able to do a deep dive into the study results and all, uh, all the way through to the clinical implications that we expect for the future. So there's a robust program that we're looking forward to um, leading and seeing the results of in, in the coming years. So thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you.